Let's get going. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Ross Clark. I'm standing in for Ivano today. Uh, he's on a trip. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, today's seminar is uh, with Tom Denton. He's um, a researcher at Google Research. Uh, and Tom and I had the opportunity to chat a month or so ago on a, um, a cruise up the Elkhorn Slough. And I was talking a little bit about some of the uh, work our group's been doing to try and quantify um, animal populations uh, um, associated with our estuaries. And Tom was talking about some of the um, acoustic um, sampling tools that he and his colleagues are developing at Google. And it sounded like a really interesting new um, technique for quantifying um, uh, populations of uh, animals within the natural environment. And I thought, well, it would be great to have him down and share some of um, this new technology with all of us that are trying to actually quantify um, the world around us. So, Tom, thank you very much for being here. Uh, cool. Yeah, just shout if I'm not talking loudly enough or anything like this. Unless you're online and can't hear me, in which case I can't hear you either. So, good luck with that. Um, yeah, so my name's Tom Denton. I've been working at Google for a while now. Um, been doing bioacoustics at Google for about five years, originally sort of as a side project, but then I've been kind of leading a team of researchers on it for the last couple of years. Um, our goal is, I think we'll kind of see over the course of this talk, is to try to make the analysis side a lot easier and make some of the machine learning parts of things a lot easier for folks to do. Um, and we really work with uh, groups all over the world, which is just incredibly gratifying and Get to, get to hear all sorts of fun animal facts from all over the place. It's really great. But yeah, so bioacoustics, what's it about? So let's imagine we like close our eyes for a moment and then open them and we've been teleported to this rainforest. So we look at this rainforest and uh, what we see is a bunch of like leaves and trees and a lot of mist because it's really humid because this is a rainforest. Um, but what we don't see there are are really the animals, right? Uh, but if we open our ears, we might hear some a, a lot of stuff going on. So here's a, you know, just some random example background audio. And in there, there's a combination of insects, different birds, and you can get different kinds of mammals as well, depending where you're at and, and this sort of thing. So. I like to say that you hear 10 times what you see. And particularly birders that we've worked with in the past, like this really is how they work. It's uh, you know, for every one thing that you manage to see, you're gonna be able to count about 10 or so uh, just from what you hear. So for you know probably 20 years or so now, it's been like fairly technically feasible to, I guess, staple a um, audio recorder to the side of a tree and leave it running for a while and start collecting a bunch of recordings. So this is an autonomous recording unit. And so if you do this, you're engaging in what we call passive acoustic monitoring, PAM. Um, and it's really easy to just sort of gather up thousands and thousands of hours of audio this way. Um, units have gotten cheaper, as we'll sort of see in a little bit. Uh, so it becomes very easy to accumulate huge masses of audio this way. But you start running into a problem when you want to take this apart and figure out what's in it. Right? Um, I've got friends that work on camera traps. They're sort of motion detectors and get photos of animals walking by. And their usual starting place is like, okay, we need to get rid of like 99% of the images that are captured by the motion capture because it's mostly like moving leaves and sticks and stuff. Um, and very, very rarely they'll actually get an animal in there. Problem we have is, uh, you know, we'll actually have real animal vocalizations going on in like 75% or more of the, uh, of the audio. Um, Got a, yeah, some friends that run microphones 24 seven, and yeah, like even including all of the night recordings and things like this, it's still like there's a lot of activity going on. So there's a lot there. You want to be able to pull it apart and kind of figure out what's going on in there, and that's where the machine learning part comes in. Um, this is another quote. This is from uh, this book, The Sounds of Life by Karen Bather, which is just a really, really fantastic book that came out last year, looking especially at digital bioacoustics and uh, machine learning relationships to it. It's um, very, very fun. 
yeah, let's just read this. So the microscope enabled humans to see anew with both our eyes and imaginations. Digital acoustics are an invention of similar significance. Today we're hearing things we never imagined we could hear. And I find that very inspiring and gratifying because it tells me I'm working on interesting stuff. Um, but, you know, I think this is a really nice way to think about things. So the microscope, it sort of like opens up this sort of molecular world that we didn't really know about before. But at the end of the day, it's sort of a, you know, it's a metal pipe with a couple pieces of glass at the end, right? And it allows us to observe things in a new way. And it allows us to connect those observations to our notifications. <laughs> so let's kill those for now. Okay, that should stop. Um, yeah, so we can connect those observations on one end to our ability to interpret those on the other with this sort of like boring piece of metal in between. And the acoustics, you know, this process of like, hey, it's just a microphone, right? Like that's our observation. And we wanna get to where we can interpret these things readily. And there's a lot of things that we can do as we, as we learn. And a lot of things that bioacoustics can help us with in conservation as well. So here's a bunch of questions where bioacoustics has a role to play in helping us answer them. So what's the most important land to protect? Uh, we've got this big 30 by 30 goal of protecting 30% of land and sea by 2030. Um, and a bunch of groups that you know, have limited resources that need to figure out what are we going to bring into preservation? What, you know, how do we want to extend this footprint? Um, and how do we you know, figure out where the endangered species are that we want to protect? How do we figure where the uh, areas of high biodiversity that we want to protect are? How do we extend them? How do we monitor for illegal human activity, like illegal logging, um, trawl fishing, poachers, this sort of thing? Sometimes we do want to count broad biodiversity, so like what's the sort of, as close as we can to some sort of a census of what's going on here, and like actually listening can be a good way to get started on that. Um, we can in detect invasive species early. It's um, incredibly helpful in keeping those populations from getting really established and overrunning. Um, and then noise pollution is also really big, and as you guys probably know, uh, it's a really big problem underwater, especially because Humans don't have our heads underwater all the time, and so we don't complain about the noise. Uh, but it's really impactful for uh, whales and other, other submarine animals. Okay, so the first part I'm gonna do here is sort of a like, how, how do we actually do some of this monitoring? And then I'm gonna spend a bit more time on um, sort of the analysis research end and kind of the tools that we've been developing. Um, so the first, place to start, so when we're looking at a bioacoustics problem, is just thinking about what kind of problem we're looking at. And usually it's either gonna be broad monitoring, so somebody wants to know like all of the bird species that are around, or they might wanna know something about a very particular species, like the red-legged frog, right? And these two problems have really different characteristics. So when we're building a classifier, uh, so you'll have like false positives and false negatives, right? Some things right, some things wrong, you miss some things, you hit some things. And if you, so if you're doing broad monitoring, you're looking at a whole lot of species, um, it turns out that you want precision first and then you wanna start bringing up recall afterwards. So you've got so many species and so many sites that you're looking at that you really don't want false positives getting in the mix because that's gonna waste a whole lot of analyst time to try to filter those out. So you try to get like, hey, let's, hit all the species that we think we can get high precision on, and then maybe over time we'll start extending that footprint, and we'll get better at sort of recovering things uh, into this sort of high precision world castle that we're building for ourselves. For species monitoring, for like endangered species or invasive species, we often really, really care about whether that individual is there or not, right? So for those ones, we often wanna maximize recall and then go into precision afterwards, right? So wanna make sure that we're getting as much as we can, and then we can probably like burn some graduate student gray hairs to, uh, to try to get to the bottom of whether it's there or not. Um, yeah, and often in these cases, the training data can be really scarce and we might care about very specific questions. So like, is this the sort of call that you get when something is nesting in the area or is it just something passing through or using this in a different way? Juvenile calls is one I'm really fascinated by too. 
Um, so we've got some tools that sort of help us with this, these different kinds of analysis. Um, so we've got hardware, which I'll sort of run over some of the hardware that's out there in a moment. Um, and then for the analysis part, we've got sort of off-the-shelf machine learning models, um, which are useful for broad species identification. And these have mainly been released in the last couple of years, or I don't know, last four years or five years. They've started getting quite good. Um, and then we also have these sort of workflows for creating custom models. So when you're dealing with a new species that people haven't really studied before, that we don't have very much training data for, or you're interested in like particular call types or any of these sorts of things. And, there's a, and that's sort of the area that I work kind of mostly in, is how do, we, how do we address new problems efficiently? So hardware, um, this QR code goes to one of my favorite like nature videos, it's great, how to count a wolf, and this is a still from that video. Uh, so this is from a Justin Kitsis lab, and that green PCB board is a, what's called an audio MOS, so a particular passive acoustic microphone. Uh, the microphone itself is about, I think it's like $70 now, uh, but some, we have inflation, but somehow it's gone down in price. Um, and for 30 bucks, you can buy a case to put it in, or you can just get Ziploc bags with some, uh, with some, some of those like absorbent things, and you know, it works just fine apparently. Um, but yeah, so for microphones, there's some trade-off between cost and quality. So Audio Moth is uh, the cheapest one. Uh, like I said, you know, it's, yeah, maybe 100 bucks with a case and an SD card. Um, some folks develop this as open source hardware. Uh, it can be a little bit hard to get sometimes, but there's a lot available now right now, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, and there's a lot of choices for higher quality boards um, that, you know, give you a little bit better signal to noise ratio. So, like, you might hear some somewhat more distant things. Um, but otherwise, they're, you know, pretty, pretty comparable. And the other nice thing going on is that because AudioMoth is so cheap, it's been forcing some of the other ones to come down from their like $500 per microphone price point. And you know, and the, the sort of nice thing to think about here too is like if you've got a choice between a $100 microphone and a $500 microphone, it's a, you know, you could have slightly better signal to noise ratio at this one point. Um, or you could put out five times as many microphones and just get a lot more coverage. Right? So, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of the audio moth. Um, the devices, they typically have really flexible configuration. Uh, so this is from audio moth's configuration app. And you're basically looking at a trade-off between how long are you going to record, uh, which is going to tell you something about battery life, so how long are you going to be able to record for? Um, and SD card space, so how long are you going to fill up your storage? And that's not too much of a problem if you're like wandering by you know, every couple of weeks or something like this. Um, but if you want something where you like drop it and come by and pick it up in a couple months, then you can sort of set up one of these uh, schedules to say like, you know, let's get a few hours around dawn because maybe we're mostly interested in birds. And let's also add like five minutes at the start of every hour to make sure that we've got kind of good coverage over the rest of the day and have some ability to observe what might be coming later in the afternoon and things like this. Allow ourselves a bit of surprise as well. Yeah, and then sort of at the bottom here, we can see like it's giving us this kind of estimate of how much space it's going to be filling up each day and how much power it's going to be using. Um, so this is for this sort of model where we like put out the microphone and then we go pick it up and now we've got this SD card full of audio and we're going to like analyze that later, right? So sort of after, after a field season or at the end of each week or however we want to do it. Um, there's also some solutions out there for live monitoring and live alerting. Uh, the folks that really started on this were, was this group Rainforest Connection, who were really great. Uh, they were doing live monitoring for chainsaws in the Amazon um, in order to send people out to respond to those directly when they were detected. And they've got some sort of a system up now that you, know, you can use this for other kinds of problems. Um, where I mentioned that trade-off between power and recording time before, once you start Thinking about live monitoring, you have a, you've got an even harder problem on two fronts. So you also have to like run your machine learning models on device, which can be pretty hard to develop those models in the first place. 
um, and then they might need a good bit of power while you're running them to sort of listen to all of that audio. Um, but you also need to send stuff back to base and actually like sending out signal over you know, your cellular network or to a satellite in some cases um, can also be pretty expensive for power. So yeah, so the Guardian platform from Rainforest Connection, that's really set up for like really remote areas. Uh, it can throw a pile of solar cells next to it. I think one of their, I don't actually have a photo of it here, but their sort of usual photo is like way up in a tree with like a bunch of solar panels kind of attached to the top of the tree. Um, and then it'll like communicate with the satellite to like give you those detections back. Um, and then there's another one that's much more recent. So this bird weather um, PUC device, um, which is, I like, bird weather's great. They do really cool stuff. Um, but it's a little bit more consumer facing and it's kind of, you know, you're going to be changing batteries in it or you're actually attaching it to mains power, this sort of thing. So yeah, can't, can't get you into remote areas in quite the same way. Okay, so that's that. So broad species monitoring, um, this is, uh, you know, this is the part I think a little bit less about in my day to day, so I'm gonna kind of speed through it. Um, you know, if you wanna get started just like counting lots of birds, uh, I would suggest that you go pick up BirdNet. Um, it's one of two bird classifiers developed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, covers about 5,000 species. Um, they develop it for science and conservation monitoring and use it for that all around the world. It's great. Um, has some ability to take metadata, so like, you know, yes, we're in California, that is not a European robin, this kind of thing. Uh, so it helps narrow things down for you that way. Um, and yeah, and I'll mention this. So it works on three second windows. Our model called Perch works on five second windows. That doesn't really matter, but it's kind of like, here's how we kind of work, right? So we're gonna take a chunk of audio, we're gonna create a spectrogram from that, and then we're going to throw that through some sort of a classifier that's gonna give us some, what we call logits or probabilities for each species. Um, and then that bird weather that I mentioned before, they, they use BirdNet as well. And they've got a cool website where you can sort of see real time detections happening all over the world. Um, a couple of bits of funniness that, you know, actually make broad bird song detection still kind of tough, but things are getting better, especially in the US and Europe. Um, so classifier quality can vary pretty wide, widely by species. So in this picture, we've got our, you know, let's take a look just at our precision. So this is from a paper uh, by Jerry Cole from Institute of Bird Populations. I thought I had a thing for him here, but apparently I lost it. Um, and so we can see like the common raven has like a really, really low precision, but the California coyote has a really high precision. And you can sort of like, run through scenarios in your mind as to why that might be, um, but it is kind of the case that like, you know, quality varies from one species to the next. And so like I mentioned before, you wanna try to like, maybe hone in on some species where we say like, yeah, okay, we've got high precision, uh, we can reliably monitor for this set of species and for a few of these other species where we might have really bad performance, you know, maybe we'll just leave those off until we, until we get something good. Um, if I wanna do sort of like a really low effort thing um, and try to like tack it onto some like study I'm doing about carbon capture or whatever, um, you know, basically what you wanna get to is like, what is the set of species that has been present at this site? And the way I would usually look at to do that is kind of pick some sort of a threshold for the model for each of these species. And then for the high probability examples, just go and double check that we can get a trophy recording. So this is what I would think of as sort of the, um, you know, kind of like the minimal viable product for a scientific paper. <laughs> um, you know, get your detections, have an idea of like what, what set of species you're looking at, and then you can just double check that like, yeah, that was actually detected and, and we've got what we're after here. Um, and this is what we would call naive occupancy. If you've got really good coverage of recordings, you can actually get like quite a lot done. Um, if you wanna go much deeper, uh, there's this whole branch of a uh, sort of statistics called a, or ecology, you know, statistics and ecology called occupancy modeling. 
where basically what it comes down to is that it's, um, you've got detection rates. So like we get like, you know, let's say at one site we get 100 detections of this bird and at this other site we get 200. So we get, ostensibly we might say, oh, maybe there's more birds at this other site. But there's actually like a lot of different things that could be going on, right? It could be that there's some other, you know, maybe a lot more noise at the first site that makes things harder to identify in the first place. Um, or any of a hundred other things. Um, I think I've seen them all at this point, but <laughs> throws a lot of wrenches in things. Um, but as a result, people typically try to use detection as a way to get at presence absence. Right? Um, and then occupancy is this sort of abs more abstract probability that a species is present at a site given some set of observations and metadata about the site. So like we know what the elevation is, we know about rainfall patterns, whatever else we wanna throw in the mix. And we've got some set of observations, maybe human observations, maybe detections from a machine learning detector. Um, and we wanna put that together and get some sort of probability that the species is actually present. And this was originally developed for point count data where you might go and like listen and count for three or five minutes. Um, but you probably miss a lot because you're not there for very long. Um, but you end up with lots of these sort of observations, geographically distributed, and you want to kind of fill in the blanks. This is exactly what I was talking with Ross about before, uh, <laughs> before the talk. Um, oh yeah, and there's Jerry Call's paper, uh, that QR code. Um, so that's a really nice paper to take a look at for this sort of like occupancy and um, uh, bird monitoring in particular. So species specific ID. So now things are gonna ramp up and get fun. Uh, this is kind of what I work on more. So one of the problems we've run into is that like this problem of classification. So like if I'm gonna go and build a classifier for everything, it doesn't quite scale in the way we want it to, right? Like we can run the classifier on as much data as we want to, but like we're kind of always running into new questions. And you know, however, you know, I can put 10,000 birds in my classifier, but the quality is gonna be really up and down and you might really care about one of the species where the quality isn't really there because you know, we just don't have data for it and it's a rare species and you care a lot about it. Um, and we wanna have ways to address that. Um, and building up custom classifiers historically has been really pretty difficult and tends to involve the close involvement of machine learning experts. And we really just don't have enough machine learning experts for the number of important problems we wanna questions we want to answer. And so the problem we come to is how do we build a system to efficiently answer questions which have never been asked before? Right. And I feel like this is sort of the, the Cohen that I sit with on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we can do is we can sort of like pull apart what the workflow for passive acoustic analysis looks like. So we go out and we collect thousands of hours of audio, or millions in some case, um, and then, you know, from that, we're gonna pull out some training data. We're gonna train up a classifier. We're going to evaluate how good a job that classifier is doing. We're gonna say that that classifier is trash, and then we're gonna go back and we're gonna maybe get more training data and train the classifier again. And we'll evaluate the classifier, and maybe while we're like, ah, it's good enough or I'm running out of funding, so we better finish this paper. Um, and then we're gonna run inference, and then, we can start to answer some ecology questions, right? And so there's some problems here. So we've got lots of audio just to deal with. That actually ends up being a bit of a problem on a day-to-day -day basis for a lot of folks. Um, you know, this problem of like collecting, you know, if we need to collect thousands of examples for this classifier to work well, you know, that's really like leaning a lot on the time of these ecologists and conservationists uh, who can probably be doing, you know, much more <laughs> I don't know, useful work in the long run, I think. Um, and, you know, if we have machine learning experts that need to, like, train the classifier every time, then we get this sort of, like, back and forth between the ecologists and machine learning groups, which, like, can take a long time and can add months and months to a, uh, to a project. So we want this whole thing to run faster, right? We want to be able to get through this process a lot faster. And if we can go faster, you know, similar to like, if I've got more microphones, I can get more coverage, right? It's not that we work less. <laughs> what ends up happening is if we can go 10 times faster, we can answer 10 times as many questions, right? So that's where we wanna get to. 
We also have a bit more ability to fail fast. So like if I invest a lot in one particular way of coming at a problem and it's not really working, you know, the sort of like, how much have I lost if I have to throw away a year's worth of work? I'm gonna like really maybe get stuck on that sunk cost and keep trying to make it work even though there's a better thing sitting right next door. So if I can fail fast, I can try out more things and get to the things that are working. And ultimately, we wanna improve the focus on the end goal. Yeah, our ultimate goal is protecting ecosystems, not building classifiers. Protecting, restoring, however you wanna put that. Um, so, you know, there's bottlenecks in this process, so we should identify those bottlenecks if we wanna make the whole thing run faster. And then we should try to address them. So, yeah, collecting the training data can take a long time, especially if they're rare signals and a huge body of audio. Um, it's almost like you're solving the problem with humans before you're able to solve the problem with the machine learning device. Um, we need this ML expert and all this, all this crap. <laughs> so we want to try to get rid of all this. Um, and so the piece that we can really help with on the Google side um, is really this piece in the middle. Like, we're really not the people who are gonna be putting microphones in forests. Um, I have a standard joke about that. Uh, and yeah. Nobody wants to find a microphone with, go on, go on a long hike and find a microphone in, in the middle of nowhere with Google written on the side. Uh, that's my standard joke. Um, so we, we, we don't wanna do that. Um, and we're also not ecologists, right? I'm a, I'm a mathematician by training, so I don't wanna like pretend to be able to answer ecology questions well. But all this stuff in the middle, we can actually help with quite a bit. So what we found, so this is sort of the recipe, and I'm gonna go over the pieces of this as we move forward. So we can use a pre-trained model to embed target data, and I'll say exactly what that means in a moment. That'll give us these things called embeddings for each of these sort of five second clips of audio. And what we find is that we can use embeddings to search for relevant audio in some really big collection. So we can find what we're looking for a bit more easily um, than just having somebody listen to everything sequentially. Then we can train up a small classifier because these embeddings are already pretty good. And we can sort of wrap all of this up in a nicer sort of UX so that ecologists, conservationists can kind of run the ship themselves and get new versions of the classifier without having to you know, come back to the machine learning experts on a, on a per iteration basis. Um, and then ultimately, when we put all of this together, we get a system that's simple enough for, I hope, anyone to use. Um, so you don't have to wait for that iteration with the machine learning folks. Um, you can sort of like see where things are at yourself and sort of surface more data, try to deal with the problems a little bit more directly. And kind of the game we're trying to get to is a world where we can like have a new classifier that's good enough for you know, good scientific work in the course of like an afternoon or so. So that, that's where we're headed. Yeah. And if all goes according to plan, then our sort of like diagram where we have all those steps should end up looking a little bit more like this, where we collect the audio data, we do that ML stuff, it's like the boring metal pipe in the middle of our microscope, um, and then we answer the ecology question, because that's, that's what we're here to do. Okay, so what's an embedding? Um, so this is sort of the process that the model uses, and so we take some audio input, say five seconds, and um, we put this through a front end, which creates this spectrogram, so this is sort of a picture of the sound. Um, time is on the x-axis, frequency is on the y-axis, so sort of higher pitch things are up near the top, lower pitch things are at the bottom, and it goes over time. Um, so we get the spectrogram that's a picture of the audio, and then we feed this into a neural network that's good at looking at pictures. And the output of that neural network is this sort of classification, set of classification scores for whatever it was that we were using at training time. So maybe it says there's a 98% chance that this is a, some sort of a dove, 87% chance it's a parrot, and 0% chance it's a koala. Um, so this is kind of the, what you expect out of your classifier, right? And then our embedding is just gonna be for today's purposes, there's a few different ways to get embeddings, but the one we're gonna be talking about today is we take that classifier and the layer right before you get those probabilities, so the, the numbers that come out of the network right before that last transformation where they become probabilities, 
it's really just like a logistic regression. So there's a vector that's there, that's sort of a fingerprint of that audio, this kind of like colored set of numbers here, it's like a fingerprint of what was in that audio, and you can think of it as like the best, you know, list of numbers that you could possibly ever get together for identifying which of the world's 10,000 bird species is in this five seconds of audio. So that's, that's what we want to think of as our embedding. So like this really good fingerprint of the audio that helps us tell which bird might be present in the audio. Oops, wrong way. And this turns out to be a really, really good um, embedding for new problems. So we did this study where we took a bunch of new problems that the classifier wasn't trained on, and we looked at the embeddings that came out for these sort of new problems, and we trained up some classifiers just on top of those embeddings. Right? So for this particular problem, we're looking at godwits, so that's a type of bird, um, and we're looking at call types, and in this data set, there's five different call types. Um, so and then what we've done, so we have four different models on the bottom here, so let's look here first. And we've taken all of the embeddings from these four different models. Perch, that's my group on the right. BirdNet, they're great too, they're at Cornell. And then these are a couple of like general purpose audio classification models that are trained on YouTube data. And so we take all of those embeddings, so each of these points is a different Godwood call from the data set and we project them down to two dimensions, and we color them according to whatever, you know, whatever call type it was. And what we can see is, um, uh, yeah. So basically what we see is that for like this general audio event classifier, the embeddings that we get out, you know, there's this sort of muddy mess in the middle, right? Like you can get some things kind of isolated, but things are really muddy. And then with the bird classifiers, you know, things are really well separated already. Like this green, uh, there's like a little bit of stuff that's overlapping there, but like the green is actually pretty distinct from everything else, from the orange, from the purple, from the blue, from the red. So we've got some pretty good signal here. And that property that things are already sort of pulled apart and pre-clustered makes it really, really easy to put a classifier on top of that for this problem that we're looking at. So this graph on the top, so the y-axis is ROCAUC, so this is just a quality measure for how good the classifier that we got is. And the x-axis is the number of training examples per class we had. So this is um, four classes, or sorry, five classes. And so on the left, we're just giving it four examples per class, so 20 training examples in all, and then using the rest of the data set for evaluation. And we're able, with our bird classifier embeddings, bird, net, and perch, to get well above a 90% RRCAUC with just the 20 training examples. And then as we put more examples in uh, for training, you know, thing, things go up pretty, pretty steadily. So what this is saying is that when we have these embeddings for this new problem, this Godwood call problem, things are already pretty nicely separated, so we can classify them easily, and we actually don't need very much training data to do it because it's so well separated. Um, now, you might say, well, godwits are a bird, so that's, this, this thing was trained to classify different bird species, so that seems like it should be pretty easy. Um, but this is actually kind of, you know, you don't know that a priori, right? So it could be that all of the data goes through our model, and at the very end we have something that says, yes, this is a godwit, um, but I've preserved none of the information about which call type it is, right? So that's, that's a thing that could happen. And what we've shown here is that that's not what actually happens, right? So this sort of sufficient information to tell you what kind of call type it was has been preserved even though we were training this thing to identify species. But wait, that's not all. Um, so the Godwit call type, that's a pretty, those ones are pretty easy. The yellow hammer dialect, so this is a bird species, uh, Europe, uh, we are looking at two different dialects, so this is sort of a geographic variance in the call. And the song for the yellow hammer, the first part has some like sort of individual variability, so it's kind of all over the place, uh, but you can tell it's a yellow hammer. And then the second part of the song, if it's a high note than a low note, you're in one part of Germany, and if it's a low note than a high note, you're in a different part of Germany, okay? And so that high low versus low high that's what we're actually trying to capture with this classifier. 
And there's all of this other variation in the song. Uh, so, you know, it's a real question of like, can we pull that out or not? And the answer is yes, but you need a bit more training data to do it. And we really need the, uh, the sort of bird embeddings to do it. Um, so, okay, we can do that even when it's hard. Um, the bat species, so if we take spectrograms of bat echolocation calls and then frequency shift them into the audible range so that the bird classifier actually has a chance to get some signal, uh, we can do a really good job of classifying those. I think that one was looking at four different bat species. And then you'll say, well, obviously that works because bats can fly and birds can fly, so that seems obvious. Um, so then we try uh, marine mammals. So there's a few decent marine mammal data sets out there, and we find that we can do a pretty good shot with those. This is with 32 species of marine mammals, um, and even with four examples per species, doing an okay job. So that's pretty good. Um, and then you say, ah, swimming is just flying underwater. So, so that's easy. Uh, but then we also do a good job with frogs. So, you know, so I'll say that we've shown that we can do some good things with things that aren't birds. Um, and then the bird species one that's the last one there is some bird species that like really weren't, weren't around in the training set for these models uh, from Peru in particular. So yeah, so we can work on new problems very efficiently. But we can do a little bit more. Oh, where's my pretty background picture? Hmm. Oh well. Ooh, yeah, all sorts of fun graphics problems going on here. Well, they'll show up in a minute, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, I wonder if that's not showing up. Oh, okay, yeah, so there's that pretty picture. There we go, okay, just go back and forth until they show up. So search, so these embeddings, you know, they're sort of well organized in the first place, right? So we've got new pieces of audio that we're interested in. And what we can do is if you show up with thousands of hours of audio, we can compute these embeddings for all of these different pieces of audio that you have. So we break it up into five second chunks, take an embedding for each one, throw it all on a database somewhere with a pointer back to the audio that it came from. Right? So we just have the embedding and then this like little bit of information that says go look at this WAV file 37 minutes and 26 seconds in and you'll, you'll find the piece of audio that goes with this embedding. And then if you show up with some new sound that you're interested in, uh, we can use that for search. And we take that new piece of audio, we compute an embedding for that, and then we can compare it to each of the things in our database and see which ones are closest. Right? And then because things are sort of well separated, so in that picture we saw before, you know, it's like, oh yeah, okay, we should be in one of the neighborhoods of, or in the neighborhood of something like the thing that we're looking for. So then that lets us, you know, we can do an okay job without very much training data, uh, but we can also start pulling up data that is similar to what we're looking for very efficiently. Uh, this is a, I believe it's a hairy woodpecker. And then um, this is a few examples of things that came out of an actual search. So the top three are, you know, pretty, pretty clearly also woodpecker drumming. And then these two, they're like sort of hidden in the background, but they are there. So like we're able to do an okay job there. And part of the way that we do this, and why I'm able to draw a picture that's quite this pretty on the right-hand side, um, is that we also develop some algorithms for source separation. So that audio that we heard in the beginning, so that Costa Rican rainforest, we can run through this source separation algorithm that we developed and pull it apart into its pieces. So probably heard some insects up in the high pitch. And there's this sort of cackling bird. And then there's this other sort of high pitch bird that people usually don't hear the first couple of times they listen to the main audio. And then if we go back and listen to the original, so you hear it once you know to listen for it. Um, so this is pretty cool. And then what we can do is we can actually get an embedding for each of these separated channels, right? And then when you show up with your new piece of audio, we can try to match that against each of the separated channels and see what comes out. So in that previous example, 
you know, this sort of blue thing we're seeing in each of these different places and we're able to get a match on those particular channels for things like, like yeah, go listen to that piece of audio, even though it's kind of in the background and hard to make out. Um, yeah, this is just sort of more bragging about how well this works. Uh, I'm gonna keep going. Um, Another thing we did, so the search thing was working well. So there's this group called the Australian Acoustic Observatory in Australia. Um, they have about 360 microphones uh, spread out across the continent. Um, they've got about 2 million hours of audio. And uh, we basically helped build this search tool for them. And maybe I'll just try to give a quick demo of that. Because, um, oh no! Uh, okay, well, we'll just have to look at pictures then. Um, I think that's literally the first time this hasn't worked. The, uh, the demo gods have been extremely, extremely kind to me with the, uh, the acoustic observatory search tool. Um, but we'll just have to sort of pretend that, oh yeah, okay, here's some pictures. Um, but yeah, so this is some example results. Obviously, everybody in this room knows what the spectrogram of a la laughing kookaburra looks like. Um, this is four of those. Um, and we basically put together this graphical utility that lets folks search over that data set efficiently um, and do all sorts of filtering. Uh, there's like a map that we can show of like where the different recordings are at and we can sort of zoom in on areas of the map to try to, try to get sort of geographically specific examples. Um, once you find the stuff you're interested in, you can like download a CSV with results um, and then start using that in all sorts of other tools. Um, it's also surprisingly mobile friendly. Uh, so you can actually just like try holding your phone up and it's not gonna be terribly helpful here because it's searching an Australian data set, but it's a thing you can do. Um, the other thing that we do is, um, so we've put together what's called a agile modeling um, framework. So this is this sort of whole process put together in a single uh, CoLab notebook, Python notebook that you can run through. And you know, so you point at it some data that you've got. So like you say, hey, here's a big list of where to find all the WAV files. And we can you know, run through some cells then that embed everything. So then we get embeddings of everything. And then we can search. So you can say like, okay, here's the thing I wanna look for. Find me a bunch of examples of that. Then we can build the classifier. So I think this is even here. Yeah, so we've got our audio similarity search. Um, then we can train a classifier. Oh yeah, so when we get results from the search, you know, it looks sort of like this. So here's a bunch of stuff. And then we've got a couple buttons you can press for, you know, is this the wood thrush I was looking for or is it something else? Click on a bunch of those, yes, yes, no, no, yes, no, yes. And then those get folded into label data that we can use for training that linear classifier. Then once we've got that classifier, we can run it over all of those embeddings that we've already computed and show you more results. So results from what the classifier is able to surface for you. And you can look at those and say, yes, yes, no, no, yes, no, yes. You can add more classes if you want to, if it's consistently getting something wrong or this kind of thing. Um, and you can iterate on that process yourself without, you know, if it really doesn't work, you can come knock on my door, I'll answer. Um, but in many cases, you can sort of go through that process of refinement on your own and get something really interesting. Um, and then at the end of the day, we can again sort of like run this over the entire data set you've embedded, write out some CSVs, and then you can like use those CSVs in R or whatever other sort of analysis you wanna run. Um, it's Python, but like we try to set everything up where you don't actually have to really know Python to do it. And uh, a lot of the way that we've been doing this is um, when folks have some problem that they want answered, you know, maybe it's, there's a, there's a tree frog in northern India in the Western Ghats that somebody approached me about a while ago. That was the other frog problem that came up. Um, and basically what we say is like, okay, who's, who's the most tech savvy person in your lab? We're gonna sort of run through the notebook with them, make sure they're able to run it. It's usually not too bad. Um, and then that person's able to sort of like pass the skills on to whoever else. Um, we try to make it as easy as possible um, just for that initial communication on, you know, 
Zoom meetings sort of things. It's helpful to have somebody with, you know, whoever your best problem solver is for tech stuff. Whether it's an amazing problem solver or whatever, somebody who's just the person people lean on. Uh, we do what we can to get you through. Um, yeah, and that QR code goes to this notebook, so you can pick it up and try it out if you want. Um, it also includes this sort of like example of going through for, uh, for wood thrush in particular, so you can like try it out and get an idea of how it works even without um, already having your own data. Cool. Yeah, so that's kind of what we've been up to. Um, so this, you know, I think of this agile modeling notebook is really like that. This is the thing that's kind of moving in the direction of being that like metal, boring metal tube that connects the two lenses of observation and analysis. Um, so what we're up to, or you know, what I'm up to, I guess, in some cases. Um, so yeah, we've got a lot of stuff going on in Australia, a bunch of fun partners we're working with, and we really wanna like organize all of the existing data that folks have, um, and then use some of the search tooling to help fill in the gaps and really try to get good coverage. Um, one of the things going on here is like, so like BirdNet that I mentioned before, you know, the training data sets that we have for bird sounds, um, they're really concentrated in North America and Europe. You know, there's, I think, my favorite source for training data for bird sounds is Zeno Canto, this website. Um, and they've got pretty much an example of just about every species. I think somebody even went out and got like a, a sound of like a turkey vulture like clapping or something so that they could say that something. Um, but there's at least something for everything, but often very, very, very little. Um, and it's really like North America and Europe, as a result, are where we have classifiers that work really well. And even going to Australia, things, are, things still have a ways to go. So hoping that we look back and say 2024 was really the year that like we got Australian bioacoustics really working. Um, we're also looking at extending to new domains, uh, so connecting to different databases of bird sound, um, other websites that exist, this sort of thing, and also integrating with existing platforms and software. So yeah, friends that provide uh, platforms, things like this. Um, yeah, we wanna help them succeed. And yeah, in the agile modeling notebooks, we're continuing to improve and iterate on those and make them available for folks. So yeah, I think that's about what I had. Um, that leaves us about 12 minutes for questions. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, because we're online, we're gonna have people that ask questions use the microphone. Uh, so any questions to start with? Yes. Oh, that was really interesting. Uh, I had a question about the, I guess, the length of the window for the embedding, right? Like you guys use five seconds, the other group three. Yep. Does, it, does it matter, I guess, the, the length of that window and their advantages, disadvantages to having a longer or a shorter window for, for I guess, building your classifiers and how successful they are? Yeah, I, yeah, do I give the one minute answer or the 30 minute answer? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the short answer is like it doesn't matter that much so long as we're looking at things in this windowed way. Um, there's also a lot of areas where we're asking like, can we just get away from windows entirely? So like the thing that you want is like enough to capture the thing that you're looking for. Um, and sometimes that thing that you're looking for actually depends a lot on the context. So you might have some like really marginal call Actually, this is how human annotation works, is you'll have like, here's this five minutes of audio, here's the really clear example of this thing, so I can label that one, and then I know that that's there, and I know some of its other calls that are you know, a little bit less distinct and this sort of thing, and then I'm able to label those other calls much more easily. Um, so that sort of like inference over like a long time period can be really useful with the additional context. So yeah, so that's kind of the, kind of the trade-off. Um, for training simple classifiers, which is kind of the world that we're mostly currently in, um, if you give it a really long window that includes like a lot of stuff that isn't what you're looking for, it can be very hard for the model to sort of like figure out what it is that you're asking for in some sense, or get sort of misguided in one way or another. Um, 
actually that example where like the raven has really low precision. Uh, there's ravens in the background of just about everything. And so you know, what's the difference between a recording of a raven and a recording where the raven was in the background but wasn't actually labeled? And it's really hard to sort of get to the bottom of. So yeah, I probably rambled a little bit more than you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. I learned so much. And uh, one of the things, I don't know a whole lot about bird taxonomy, but I'm wondering if, you know, more closely related birds likely have similar calls to each other. Is there some way to narrow down the pool of potential candidates to some taxonomic classification, like with ontologies, or is that a machine learning approach too? How do you approach that? Yeah. Uh, so. One of the fun, weird things about our model is we actually do have separate output classifications for every level of the taxonomy. Uh, so we are able to, you know, we might not know exactly what this weird vocalization is that we're hearing, but we're pretty sure it's a duck of some sort, and so we'll have some output that tells us that. Um, yeah, it also really varies depending where you are. So like North America, um, for songbirds, They'll have, you know, maybe similar species will have sort of similar stuff going on, but they also want to be able to tell each other apart, right? And so, like, for a lot of sparrows, there will be, like, really, like, a clear indicator somewhere in the song that, like, hey, I am this species of sparrow, and then maybe a bunch of other stuff going on that's very, like, could be different kinds of geographically specific or individually specific. Um, so, yeah. And then other places, a lot of Australian birds, it's just, like, a lot harder too. There's, there's not that level of like, it's a lot more like, I don't like anybody else instead of just like, I don't like things of my own species. <laughs> so, a lot of cross-species competition for resources in a way that like we don't see in sparrows in North America. Cool, thank you. Um, so I have a question about the splitting of the spectrogram, like the rainforest when you split it into the different species. Is yeah. that just done solely based on frequency? Um, or if there was a bird that would have like a really low pitch noise that went into a higher pitch noise, would it be able to piece that noise together or would it just split it by frequency? Yeah, so it's a, it's a bit crazier than splitting by frequency. Yeah. Uh, so we basically have a model that we trained where we take two examples of two audio examples that themselves are natural recordings. So like any any recording that you make is going to be a mixture of stuff. The C, the passing goals, uh, passing machine learning expert, whatever. Right? Like all of these things are together in recording A, and then we've got some other mix of things in recording B. So we mix those two together and you get what's called a mixture of mixtures. And then the model that we train creates all of these different output channels. And then we look at all of those output channels and try to put them back together in the best way that we can to try to approximate the original two sounds. So it's some stuff that you're doing on your end, like manually, it's not all? Uh, no, it's all fully automated. It's all fully automated. Yeah, so like that, how do you reconstruct the original two mixtures in the best way? There's a little bit of linear algebra that goes on, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> But the game is that, you know, if those, and then we sort of like look at how close that matches, right? So if you've really been able to like pull things out into their separate pieces, then it should be possible to put them back together and get those original two mixtures pretty well. If I've got two really different sounds that I've put in the same channel, but they were really different, they could have come from, each one could have come from one or the other. So putting them in the same channel leads the model to get punished and so it learns over time to sort of pull things apart. That's, that's, yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> that was a great talk, thank you very much. Um, so I had a question, um, I know just enough about how this stuff works from my computer science friends to make them angry when I try to understand it. <laughs> um, so this question might be completely wrong. Um, but from what I understand, the computer doesn't really know that it's looking at audio, it just knows that it's given a pattern and it wants to match the pattern as best it can. Um, and so if you feed in other forms of patterns, it can often do pretty well with those. So if you gave it like a depth profile from a biologging tag and you said, 
identify the feeding events for this shark or the times when this fish is going to go mate with another fish? Can it pull that sort of stuff off pretty well? So, yeah, so like the classifiers we're talking about, they're taking spectrograms of a certain size mm -hmm. and then running through, running this thing, and then we get some sort of an embedding on the other side, right? So some sort of fingerprint of whatever was in that chunk of spectrogram picture right. that we've shown to it. Um, if we, you know, we can put anything in at the top that we want to, um, but we may or may not actually get something useful out on the other side. So one of the, so like, you know, this place where we were looking at like this set of different problems. So you could also ask like, what happens if we look at really different not bioacoustic problems instead of all of these bioacoustic problems? Because we'd still be able to do an okay job. If we do a worse job on sounds from coral reefs, for example, we know that already. Um, but if you start putting in like photographs, you know, photographs look really different from spectrograms. Um, and so that embedding that we get out, it may not be as useful as something that was trained to identify images in one way or another. So I don't know, maybe is that somehow helpful? Maybe, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, it is helpful. Um, I think my question is probably a little bit. Yeah, so like, you know, you'd sort of expect that you might get something like this. Right, so like this is from a model that wasn't trained for bioacoustics trying to do a bioacoustics problem, but still it's an audio domain problem, right? So like I can pick some random set of photographs for whatever my photograph recognition problem is, feed them in and get some sort of embedding, but you know, they might be really muddy and mixed up and like not actually sort of well sorted in the way that we want them to be in order to be able to answer these, you know, the new question that you're asking today. I just had a question about the training. I thought it was just like really interesting. Um, I know that some birds, like birds have like a mimicry or they try to imitate the sounds of other birds. And I was just wondering how your model or your training has been trying to like, I don't know, get them to d discern those differences or just like how your model is doing with that issue. Yeah, uh, so we haven't gone deep on the mimicry question. Um, one of my highlights of last year was getting to hear a lyrebird display in the wild. Um, it was fantastic. Um, but what was one of the things that was interesting about, do you know what, do you know the lyrebird? Okay, so they, they mimic everything. Um, but yeah, the interesting thing about that was I was able to identify it as a lyrebird before I saw it. Um, and the reason I was able to do that was because it, I like heard a, I heard a laughing kookaburra, that spectrogram we saw before. But then I heard a lot of other things at sort of the same volume level um, coming directly after that. And so it was like, oh, it's this train of mimicry um, or this train of sounds that's clearly not actually a kookaburra then. Um, this is something else. Oh, I bet I'm hearing a lyrebird. And so this, I think, also gets at that question of like, how long is your window and what can you tell from the context? So lyrebirds, you know, that if you only looked at that one little bit, it'd be like, yeah, that's a that's a kookaburra. Um, but once you have the context, it's pretty clear that it's a lyrebird. Um, so earlier you were talking about um, like the app the wide applicability of um, the algorithm. So how you can also identify marine mammals and so is that the BERT, the, uh, the BERT program or algorithm that you're using that is just splitting out different types of sounds? Yes. Um, so if I wanted to use that, so say if I have like a recording of the ocean mm -hmm. and I wanted to identify different whales or dolphins, for example, um, will I be able to then train based on what I know, like the recording of um, a particular species and put that into the algorithm and then determine what is actually in there? Yeah, so that's exactly it. So like for this bird classifier that we have, you know, if you think about sort of the huge range of sounds that you get from birds, from you know, owls, which can be pretty low pitched, different kinds of doves are also pretty low pitched, and just all of the variety that we have in songbirds, ducks, whatever. 
Um, there's this huge variety, and we're sort of able to leverage that variety to try to identify new things. So what'll happen is when you show up with your new data, you get embeddings of everything. You know, the model doesn't know what those are, right? Like, it's just, hey, here's some new audio, here's some fingerprints for all of them. Um, and then, relatively quickly, you'll be able to sort of build this linear classifier on top, teach this linear classifier on top, what those different sorts of fingerprints are. That's really cool. Because like um, some fish and stuff, they make sounds, and that would be cool to identify them as well, because sometimes you can't see them, but. Yes. Yeah, so it, yeah, I really like it. Thank you so much. Thanks, sorry, I, we're, we're interested, lots of questions. Good. Um, I, I was thinking about something you had sort of early in your talk where you mentioned the, the sample size of common sounds and how that can become overrepresented in the identifications. Mm -hmm. What are some best approaches then to sort of neutralize or balance a data set so that your training set is not going to bias itself? Yeah, so uh, everything is biased. I don't think there's actually any way around that. And I, like for myself, I think that this is yeah, some folks go to very great lengths to try to balance things. I think it's a little bit of a fool's game in the long run because you know, even if we do get sort of like the same species count, like we'll also within species have some sample bias in terms of like where were the recordings from? Like maybe they're really geographically sample bias from, a, from like some little corner of a much larger range and this kind of thing. So, you know, ultimately, I think where we're trying to get to is we need really robust embeddings, right? So we need things that sort of like pre-sort different kinds of sounds so that when you show up with your new data set, things are already sort of like in a configuration where we can like identify what things are that you care about sufficiently. Um, and from that perspective, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter as much that something is underrepresented in the training data set for the embedding model, right? Um, you know, you might end up with some particular corner of like, hey, here's some genus with five species in it, all of which are really rare. And so we might not have a very good representation of what that corner of sound looks like, but we might still have good representations if there's other things from elsewhere that sound similar to that. So I don't know if that's somehow helpful. I think so, yeah. So are the embeddings more like, um, I guess I was thinking of them as something like a predetermined subset of like where you partition your, your data to then go and be classified. But is it more like something that's an overarching pool of information that you draw from so that you're sort of subsetting? Yeah, so like the typical way this goes is you throw out a bunch of microphones and now you've got a thousand hours of audio, right? All of it's unlabeled, right? You just pulled it off the microphone. And then we run it through this process of computing and embedding for every five seconds of audio. And so now this is just this big unlabeled pool of embeddings that we're gonna work with. And if we've got a good embedding, then whatever question is that you're actually trying to answer, like things will already be sort of like in a ball in that sort of like embedding space. Yeah. And therefore pretty easy to classify. You're right, you totally said hope. that too. And that made a lot more sense the second no, time no, no. for whatever this, reason. This is, <laughs> yeah, I don't mind repeating myself because I know it matters. But yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. This is a really um, eye-opening for me to see, uh, you know, the potential of this, of these new tools to um, really help us um, make our data collection easier or providing new opportunities for quantifying the, uh, you know, world around us. So thank you so much. Yeah, totally. Good.